from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode number 216, recorded on April 24, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me tonight from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Depomier. Hello there, Vincent. Dixon, I almost said episode 1000. How about that? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> this Friday, you'll have to say 1001. Also joining us from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. And from Glasgow, <laughs> Scotland, Christina Naula. Good evening, all. Our guest is... Tuning in from Israel, he is a professor at the School of Medicine at Tel Aviv University. Aya Lesham, welcome to TWIP. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you. Welcome. Are you having nice weather there? Oh, it's beautiful. I spent weekend hiking with my son. Flowers, all green, Excellent. nice weather. <clears throat> I spent absolutely. I spent fantastic. the weekend in an airport. Yes, oh. <laughs> that sounds painful. Yeah, painful. Uh, you know, flying is not what it's stacked up to be. No. Right. All right. You should have said, what is it cracked up to be? But that, Yeah, that you're right. It is cracked up to be. Cracked <laughs> up to be. But, uh, I, uh, I had a very nice visit at Tulane University, so it was worth the delay. That's All right. Story. So we, uh, Al is joining us because it's his case that Christina presented last time. Is that right, Christina? Yep, that's correct. So, I don't know, shall I do the recap or shall we let Eyal do the recap? You guys have been here long before me. Let me know what you decided. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, while you weren't around, Vincent, we were deciding if the if it should be landscape or portrait. Um, so, Eyal, did you want to – we've, we've got it sort of written out because we don't want to give too much away before the guessing. And, uh, you know, but I'm hoping that if you actually do the recap, maybe you'll give us a little more hints because I'm still not sure I know what this is. <laughs> I agree with you. Dan. I'm on your side on this one. <laughs> yeah, reading the answers, I thought, um, yeah, perhaps I can uh, be more accurate they oh. might help some of uh, uh, at least <laughs> you with us that's not still certain about your guess. But uh, this was a 24-year-old male. He presented to the emergency room end of February this year uh, with a four-day history of fever starting three weeks after he returned from a long trip in, in South Asia. Many Israelis go and, and backpack for many months and they bring interesting diseases, and this was one of them. He, um, he reported traveling, to, traveling in India in uh, October of the past year, and from November to early January, he traveled in Papua New Guinea, where he, uh, from in early January, he moved to Thailand, and returned to Israel three weeks before his fever began. On admission, he reports daily fever up to 40 degrees Celsius, and he also mentions that he has an itchy rash, a local itchy rash, which I described during the physical exam, and some dry cough. Um, in Thailand, he, uh, he, uh, several days after he arrived to Thailand, he had a febrile illness for which he was treated uh, with five days of doxycycline. Uh, fever resolved and uh, did not recur until he uh, returned to Israel. Um, during his stay in Papua New Guinea, he hiked in the jungles was uh, bitten multiple times by multiple insects and also reports that he was uh, swimming in some river and lakes, found some leashes on his uh, legs while he was hiking. And uh, one of these ins insect bites on his hip uh, was more uh, notable than others and uh, left a uh, mark. Um, what else? He did not have unprotected sexual uh, encounter. He did eat street food and local food wherever he went, all types of foods. He uh, couldn't specify anything, but he was very loose with his um, 
food precautions, um, on physical exam, alert and oriented, vitals are normal. Uh, physical examination was practically unremarkable except uh, the rash he complained of, which was a three-cropped physical rash on uh, his penis. And he also uh, uh, had a healed, what looked like a healed insect bite on his uh, lower hip. Uh, no other rashes. White blood cell count and differential were normal. There was no eosinophilia, hemoglobin of 13 grams per deciliter, which uh, uh, is borderline normal, and his platelet count was lower than normal, uh, with uh, 100,000 per microliter blood. And uh, the questions Christina presented are, what is your diagnosis? And what tests are uh, important to confirm the diagnosis? And Christina asks, to, you know, to be as accurate as you can when identifying the parasite causing the main symptoms. And what other special considerations you need to think about for his treatment? All right. So, uh, Ayel, do you have the notes in front of you where all the, all the guesses are? I guess you I actually do have. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, let's start with uh, <clears throat> Daniel. Can you take that first one? Certainly. Derek writes, Hi there, it's Derek yet again, and funny story about last episode. My last diagnosis came before I went over nematodes in my intro to parasitology class, and it was in the middle of lecture, I realized how wrong I was, haha. Face palmed pretty hard when I heard my last email read aloud. Uh, since it seems to be a tradition to go over the weather, this is coming to you from Miami, Florida. Currently a cloudy 75 Fahrenheit, about 24 Celsius. Humid as a swamp since we just had a heavy bout of rain. Before I submit my diagnosis, figure it all be interested in our future AI overlords diagnosis. Take it away, chat GPT. <laughs> Based on the patient's travel history, symptoms, and laboratory results, the most likely diagnosis is Plasmodium falciparum malaria. The patients travel to India, Papua New Guinea, and Thailand puts them at risk of acquiring malaria. The daily fever up to 40 C, and the rash and cough suggest a systemic infection. The presence of three cropped vesicles on the penis could indicate genital herpes, which can be sexually transmitted, and the healed insect bite could be a red herring. However, the lower platelet count suggests a parasitic infection, which is common in malaria. Therefore, the most common parasite afflicting this patient is Plasmodium falciparum. When I further prompted it to list possible tests, additional tests that may be considered based on the results of initial tests or clinical suspicion include blood cultures, urine cultures, serology for typhoid fever, scrub typhus, and other bacterial and viral infections, a skin biopsy, the vesicles on the penis, may also be considered to evaluate for viral or bacterial infection. Uh, wow, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, look out, pathologist, AI is gunning for your careers. But after that last recommendation of biopsying the penis, <laughs> I'm a little bit, uh, I, may, uh, I may ask for a second opinion. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> all right. I'll keep my own diagnosis brief. <laughs> Symptoms include fever, itchy rash, three crop penile vesicles, and unproductive cough. Symptoms started three weeks after possible exposure. Epidemiological, we have traveled from New Guinea to Thailand to Israel. Possible vectors, insects, and contaminated water, not to mention soil. I'm going to disagree with the AI as it seems our patient was taking antimalarial drugs for most of his travels. An unproductive cough stands out to me, suggests a parasite that undergoes lung migration. And the delayed onset of symptoms also suggests the possible maturation of a nematode within our unfortunate host, molts. Insect bites also stand out for me, especially the one that seems to take a while to heal, a possible infectious site. An itchy rash would suggest the parasite targets the subcutaneous skin layer or bacterial viral infection after a dirty worm entered our patient. After visiting my notes, my initial thought to be most likely culprits based off of symptoms are strongyloides fulliborni and cilostoma duodenale, hookworm, or 
Onco circa volvulus. Stronger loity seems likely given that our patient was swimming in rivers, so it's likely he took off his shoes and gave microfilaria a chance to penetrate his skin. Stronger loidiasis also seems to have a sporadic presence in New Guinea, according to the CDC. I'm discounting ancyclostomiasis due to the normal blood count, and our last contender is Onco circiasis now. I'm going to say due to probability, onchocerciasis is more likely. Strongoloidiasis seems to have a sporadic presence, <laughs> while ovalvulus has a stronger presence. Additionally, the insect bite may be close to the penis, and those vesicles might be nodules formed around adult parasites that wander to the dermis to his penis. As a male, I can't help but pity our patient if that's the case. I agree with the AI. A skin biopsy of the penis vesicles would confirm or deny my suspicions. All right. And then you you wrote in, I see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Christina, could you take ALs? Yep. Hello, Vincent and all the sages of microscopic <laughs> eukaryotes. Greetings from Sydney, Australia on the first day of daylight saving. I apologize for this lengthy email in advance, but I do hope it would be entertaining and informative. First, you guys made me laugh last episode discussing how to pronounce my name. Christina, of course, pronounced it perfectly. I did cheat. I did ask AL beforehand. <laughs> I'm disclosing that here, but Daniel had the right idea of thinking as a Canadian when pronouncing it. After many years in the States, Europe and Australia, I kept being surprised by how difficult it was for people to pronounce such a common Israeli name. In Boston, I was EL, where Australians are, la where, where Australians are a lazy bunch and just go with EL. <laughs> The best way I find is to basically pronounce it like hey Al, but change it to A Al, not E. Second, and as another AI, I have used chat GPT this week as I noticed it has come up multiple times over the last few months. I thought I might explain some misconceptions about the technology. Chat GPT is basically just a statistic machine that takes a word and guesses the next word. And so until statistically the next word is a stop, people okay. People refer to it as a stochastic parrot. However, the way it guesses the next word is where the magic of deep learning happens. The function that guesses the next word is relatively simple, algebra algebraic function, but with a huge breadth. GPT currently uses 175 billion parameters. And the next, um, oh, I, I failed to read the example that he's referring to, so I'll just skip that. The model basically learned from all the text on the web to refine those parameters, and somehow the combination results in something that is pretty remarkable. I had a discussion with ChatGPT on the case, and this is what it looked like. My guess is just a surmises with two courses of Prasiquantel, one starting in two weeks, six weeks post-exposure, and one six weeks later. But it could also be malaria, so treatment should start until ruled out. Eyal, let's talk about only parasitic infections. Are you happy with this? GPT, certainly. I am happy to discuss parasitic infections. Please let me know if you have any specific questions or topics you would like me to cover. Eyal, I will give you a patient case and would like you to provide an analysis of which parasite might cause the symptoms, specifically in the context of the patient's travel history. Please ignore any viral or bacterial options. Note, I added this because in a previous attempt, GPT included dengue fever, which is a topic reserved for another podcast. <laughs> GPT, sure, please provide me with the patient case and I will do my best to provide an analysis of which parasite may be causing their symptoms based on their travel history. Eyal, this is a case of a 24-year-old male who presented to the emergency room at the end of February with a four-day history of fever starting three weeks after he returned from a long trip. Eyal reads now the entire case to GPT. GPT, based on the patient's travel history and symptoms, one potential parasitic infection that could be causing these symptoms is a Plasmodium falciparum infection, which is the most deadly form of malaria. The patient's travel history includes visits to areas of high malaria transmission, including India, Papua New Guinea and Thailand. Additionally, the patient received doxycycline treatment in Thailand for a febrile illness, which could suggest a possible malaria infection. Other possible parasitic infections that should be considered include Leishmaniasis, 
The patient's travel history to Papua New Guinea, where he hiked in the jungle and was bitten by multiple insects, could suggest a possible Leishmaniasis infection, which is caused by parasites transmitted by sand flies. Schistosomiasis. The patient's travel history also includes swimming in multiple rivers, rivers, which could suggest a possible schistosomiasis infection, which is caused by parasitic worms that live in freshwater snails. Filariasis. The patient's history of insect bites and finding leeches attached to his lower legs could suggest a possible filariasis infection, which is caused by parasitic worms transmitted by mosquitoes and other insects. However, given the patient's symptoms of fever, itchy rash, dry cough and low platelet count, malaria seems to be the most likely parasitic infection and it is important to confirm this diagnosis with laboratory tests such as a blood smear or a rapid diagnostic test for malaria. Further evaluation of the patient's symptoms and laboratory findings might also be necessary to rule out other parasitic infections. AL Thanks for this assessment. Based on the patient not presenting with leishmaniasis symptoms or any lymph node abnormalities, I think leishmaniasis and filariasis are not likely. What tests would you run to differentiate and confirm malaria or schistosomiasis? Please don't suggest a stool exam as there wasn't enough time for potential infection for the worms to start generating eggs. GPT, you are correct. Given the patient's symptoms and physical findings, leishmaniasis and filariasis are less likely than malaria and schistosomiasis. To differentiate and confirm malaria, blood smear, or rapid diagnostic test for malaria would be necessary. The blood smear is a microscopic examination of the patient's blood to look for the presence of plasmodium parasites. This test can differentiate between the four main species of plasmodium that cause malaria and can also determine the severity of the infection. To confirm a schistosomiasis infection, various diagnostic tests can be used depending on the stage of the disease. Since the patient has just returned from a trip, it is unlikely that schistosomiasis infection has progressed to the chronic stage, where eggs are excreted in feces or urine. In this case, the preferred diagnostic test would be a serological test, such as an enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assay, ELISA, which detects antibodies against schistosome parasite in the patient's blood. Another possible test is a urine-based test called the circulated cathodic antigen, CCA test, which detects a protein produced by the schistosome parasite. It is important to note that these tests these diagnostic tests are not always conclusive and additional tests or further evaluation may be necessary to confirm the diagnosis. AL, considering the patient is in Israel, what pre-treatment course would you recommend for both malaria and schistosomiasis? GPT, the treatment of malaria depends on the severity of the infection, the species of the parasite causing the infection, and the patient's medical history and age. For Plasmodium falciparum, which is the most deadly form of malaria, the treatment of choice is usually a combination of antimalarial medications, such as Arthimeter lumefantrin, Atavaquone, Proguanil, or Quinine, plus Toxicycline or Clindamycin. Given the patient's travel history and symptoms, it would be reasonable to initiate treatment for malaria while waiting for the results of diagnostic tests. It is important to note the early treatment of malaria is crucial to prevent complications and further spread of the disease. For schistosomiasis, the treatment of choice is praziquantel, which is a medication that kills the adult worms. The dose and duration of treatment depend on the species of schistosome and the severity of the infection. Since the patient has just returned from travel, it is important to consider the possibility of co-infection with other parasitic infections, which could require additional or differential different treatments. It is recommended that the patient receive medical evaluation and treatment by a healthcare professional with experience in tropical medicine and parasitic infections. AL, you know, now that you've mentioned the treatment options for malaria, I remember that the patient has received doxycycline in the recent past. Wouldn't that decrease the likelihood of malaria infection? GPT, yes, you are correct. Doxycycline is one of the medications used for malaria prophylaxis, which means it can prevent malaria infection in individuals traveling to high-risk areas. However, doxycycline is not 100% effective in preventing malaria, especially if the 
individual has not taken the medication as prescribed or has been exposed to malaria after stopping prophylaxis. In the case of this patient, he has already completed a course of toxicycling for a febrile illness during his trip to Thailand, which suggests that he was likely taking the medication as prescribed. However, it is still possible that he could have been exposed to malaria during his travels, especially if he did not use mosquito repellent or bed nets consistently if he visited the areas with malaria transmission rates. Therefore, while the patient's use of toxicycline for prophylaxis may decrease the likelihood of malaria infection, it does not rule out the possibility entirely, and diagnostic tests for malaria should be considered, given his symptoms and travel history. Eyal, thank you. That is so kind of you. Thank you. I find this very interesting, and I think that combined with the knowledgeable person, this kind of technology could be a huge power multiplier tool. Side note, you should always be kind and respectful, even if the other side is not carbon-based. You never know what the future holds. Oh, my gosh. And that was Eyal. Uh, oh. So we're going to obviously get GPT submissions from here on in, right? <laughs> Probably, yeah. That's the second one, isn't it? And if we don't by, read, by itself or itself. <laughs> if we don't read them... I, I would refer uh, our listeners to an interesting... Uh, 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 piece published in the New England about uh, three weeks ago about the benefits, limits, and risks of GTP as an AI chatbot for uh. medicine. And I do hear from my patients, and you'll hear more of AI diagnostics, but I think our role as physicians is not yet threatened. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. That's the key word there. Yeah. Not, well, yet. not yet. That's right. That's right. It's quite worthy right. the AI is. Quite, yeah. <laughs> What was the um, the robot that they had? Uh, wasn't this at MIT um, that did all the medical examinations, Daniel? This was about five years ago. Uh, what the heck was the name of that thing? They recently had J Chat GPT take the step one medicine exam and passed on the first try. So that, really? Uh, yeah. Really? Wow. Goodness gracious. Well, they're gonna, I don't know what that says about yeah. the exam, though. Yeah, you know, it actually is worrisome, them, right? It just sort of becomes <laughs> like if ChatGPT can just look it up and spit it out, is that really what you want to test people on? Or yeah. is it more that's of a. True. Uh, that's yeah. right. That's right. Dixon, can you take the next one? I would be glad to. Stefan writes Dear TWIP team, this is my first time trying to solve one of your riddles. And I hope that despite the intense red herring exposure of the feverish patient from Israel, I can make a reasonable, educated guess. A fever in a return traveler may, uh, many differential diagnoses need to be considered. This is even more true in this case of extreme travel history to many countries in rural areas and for a prolonged period of time and with some very popular exposures like street food. Differentials can be limited by clinical presentation and incubation periods, some I exclude, since after all, this is TWIP. Viral causes, most tropical infections like dengue have a minimum of 14-day incubation period, which we can therefore rule out. In a patient with genital ulcers, which may cause us to ask some more questions about sexual exposures, we should also rule out herpes type 2 infection as, as well as syphilis and acute HIV infection. Other STDs and partner testing is advised. Bacterial causes to consider are typhoid fever, food exposure, leptospirosis, and rickettsial infection, wildlife exposure. For typhoid, I would culture, culture blood, and others are clinical and serologically diagnosed, though scrub typhus has a too long incubation in this case, but may, may have traveled, but may have traveled, but may have been the cause of previous rash uh, treated with doxycycline. So we reach parasitic fever causes. Most relevant, of course, would be malaria. <clears throat> and interestingly, Papua New Guinea would have a high risk for falciparum malaria and the incubation period, especially after taking prophylaxis and subnormal adherence or absorption may be, may be many months. Thrombocytopenia is a hallmark of malaria. It is most commonly caused by malaria or dengue in returning travelers. In our case, however, I vote against falciparum malaria since our patient has been on prophylaxis and likely was infected in Thailand. For most common tertiary and quaternary malarial 
uh, infections, the fever pattern does not quite fit. So I have the suspicion that tryptine, chosen exotic, and still rather rare plasmodium species, P. nolzai. This is endemic in jungle regions in Southeast Asia and has a sylvatic cycle among primates and is only zoonotically infects humans, especially where wildlife slash human territory borders are breached. In our case, extensive jungle exposure without repellent would be a risk factor. Nolzai malaria can be severe and doesn't have a tertian fever pattern, but rather daily fever as described in the case. To diagnosis, I would do repeated, if negative, blood smear or a quantitative buffer, buffy coat, QBC, if available. Since morphological speciation may be challenging for P. nolzai, it looks similar to P. malariae, a confirmatory PCR may be considered. Rapid tests of note may not detect this species and should always be accompanied by direct smears. I would treat with oral Artemisinin <clears throat> combination therapy if the patient is, unstable, is stable and able to ingest food otherwise, an intravenous therapy with artusinate is warranted also in case the parasitemia is in the percent range. Uh, closing the rash, uh, closing, <laughs> I would close the rash also, by the way. Closing the rash may be unrelated, for example, ancelostoma, strongyloides, skin manifestations in malaria are often particular, and I would not expect those with this high platelet count. The cough, if parasitic, may be lung migration by various agents, but normally eosinophils speak against it. I would do a CXR to rule out, come on, chest x-ray. clinical x-ray chest to x-ray. rule out contaminant bacterial infection. In a sick malaria patient, there may be acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, so proper fluid management is key in malaria treatment. I hope this guess is correct, but either way, I would be grateful if you would let me know how to pronounce Nolzai. Well, it's pronounced Nolzai. <laughs> um, thanks for all your work. Please keep it up. Best wishes and happy Easter. Stefan from Heidelberg. Sunny, three degrees C. Mm, chilly. Wow. Yeah. Uh, hey, Al, can you take the next one? Sure. So Hakon Hakim writes, Hello from Athens. This week's case had me stumped so many potential things the person could have and so many potential red herrings. Had to bring, the big, bring in the big guns. My mom was a Navy physician in Thailand and the Philippines about 30 years ago. And as much as was you and was and as such was used to seeing more exotic infections than typically seen here in the states. So I guess this would be Athens, Georgia. Originally, we were going to discount the infections. Then, to we were going to discount the phallic vesicles, phallic vesicles, as some sort of herpes or other viral infection. He had concurrent with the myriad other potential infections. However, if it was to be assumed that it was also a symptom of the main parasitic infection, then I would have to guess it to be a case of filariasis. Given the patient got better after a course of doxycycline, something we give in veterinary medicine, prior to deworming in order to shrink the worms by killing their endosymbiotic bacteria, Wolbachia, this was the best guess we could come up with. Biopsy of a vesicle, as well as potentially screening for mycophilaria as confirmation of one of these worms would confirm the diagnosis. While treatment for mycophila, uh, while treatment isn't usually necessary for dirofilariasis, it is clear here that we might use ivermectin R and O, DEC, diethyl carbamazine, carbam should it turn out to be correct. Probably would not hurt to get a blood smear and to confirm the patient doesn't have babesia or plasmodia in them as well. All the best, Hakon. All right. My turn, Michelle. 
And Alex, wait, did Daniel read one? No, you didn't, did you? I, I no, read you one somewhere in there. I don't think you've had a turn he, he yet, did. though, Vincent. He did? You read the first one, Daniel. Oh, okay. And it was read so well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Michelle and Alexander. Apparently not memorable. <laughs> from the first Vienna Parasitology Passion Club. Right, dear host, the case of the young man returning from his travels in Southeast Asia presented a considerable challenge for us. Many parasitic pathogens fit some but not all symptoms, and worse, many are inconsistent with the findings. Even after consulting with significantly more experienced colleagues, we are unable to come to a diagnosis with a reasonable amount of certainty. Therefore, we will only discuss some diseases that we have considered and add a few thoughts regarding the problem representation. Several aspects of the case are challenging. The symptoms of fever and cough are very nonspecific while the vesicular rash on the glands of the penis and the slow healing insect bite on the hip are typical only of a small number of entities. Considering pretest probability, most likely explanation for the penile rash is genital herpes. The insect bite is typical for scrub typhus, which would be our number one diagnosis to consider in this patient if this were not a parasitology podcast. The patient also received a five-day course of doxycycline, which is the correct treatment option for scrub. Typhus, also known as Sutsugamushi fever. I love that word. <laughs> Nevertheless, five days could have been too short, and there's also a possibility of doxycycline resistance. We chose to assume that both are artifacts as the only parasitic infection to our knowledge that would cause a lesion like the one on the patient's hip would be cutaneous leishmaniasis, which is not consistent with the patient's other symptoms. We know of no parasitic infections that cause penile vesicles. Several helminthic infections, including strongylodiasis and other hookworm infections, trichinellosis, acute schistosomiasis, and paragonomiasis fit the epidemiology and at least part of the symptoms, but are rendered highly unlikely by the lack of eosinophilia in the peripheral blood. While malaria is the most important differential in any traveler returning from an endemic region with fever, the correct use of prophylaxis in the incubation period of the disease make this seem unlikely. Still, infection with plasmodium species, including P. falciparum and P. nosi, should be excluded. While rare, babesiosis might also be considered as a differential as the efficacy of malaria prophylaxis against the disease, which is very rare in Southeast Asia, is doubtful. Visceral leishmaniasis may cause a fever and generally lacks eosinophilia. The slow healing ulcer is usually found in cutaneous, not visceral disease. Patients with VL usually have pronounced jaundice and hepatosplenomegaly, which is not described here. Trypanosomiasis seems impossible considering the epidemiology, as does African tick bite fever, which is also not a parasitic infection. Even after consulting our most experienced attending, we were unable to come up with a satisfying diagnosis. In a real-world scenario, we would pursue further diagnostics and consider scrub typhus the most likely diagnosis. We can't wait to hear what parasitic disease was troubling the young patient. Thanks for this great case. All the best, Michelle and Alexander. Wow. Wow. We stumped wow. them, didn't we? Daniel, you're next. All right. Kimona writes, Dear TWIP team, no slam dunk. I began filtering for parasitemia with incubation period and fever onset greater than three weeks post return from an extended Southeast Asia trip with nor low normal hemoglobin, mild thrombocytopenia, yet no eosinophilia. The latter excluded most helminthic causes since eosinophilia is usually associated with trichinella, ascariasis, filariasis, paragonomiasis. Now, schistosomiasis acquired during a river swim should also induce eosinophilia, as would visceral leishmaniasis. The painful bite to his hip region sure sounded suspicious for some type of reduved bug or tsetse fly and possible trypanosomiasis, yet geographically his travels don't fit. Ultimately, I kept returning to malaria, P. Falciparum and P. vivax are listed as the most abundant species in Papua New Guinea, 
and are also common in most rural areas of Thailand. Hypothetically, he could have been infected with P. bivax alone or a dual infection with P. falciparum. The atovaquin proguanal prophylaxis should help resist infection with even chloroquine-resistant forms of both these species, yet it would not prevent hypnozoic formation by P. vivax. We also know that one can develop malaria despite using chemoprophylaxis. He was later given doxycycline for a febrile illness once in Thailand. Doxy is listed as a slow-acting schizontocidal agent, which could delay the first relapse by five to seven weeks after finishing treatment. Alternatively, he could have a recrudescence from incomplete clearance of infection after his initial treatment with doxy. Either of these may fit with the onset of fever three weeks after his return. One study found the risk of relapse for P. vivax following antimalarial treatment was 33% in returning Swedish travelers. I haven't been able to connect the penile vesicles with any obvious blood-sucking leech, but instead postulate, the, postulate that these may be reactivation of pre-existing general herpes infection, possibly due to the stress of his malarial illness. There's also mention of increased rates of viral or bacterial infections while infected with malaria, which could explain his dry cough, as I am not sure this would be expected during a relapse and not initial infection. Diagnosis would ideally be made by GIMSA stained blood smear microscopy, allowing for species identification, quantification of parasitemia, and life cycle stage. Red blood cells infected with P. vivax are enlarged and often show stippling on the membrane known as Schufer's dots. These are also rapid diagnostic. There are also rapid diagnostic tests which are convenient and yet require a higher <clears throat> blood parasitemia load for detection. PCR can detect very low levels but is often limited to research settings. Treatment with atovaquin progonal in Southeast Asia has cure rates of greater than 95%, but since he acquired his infection on the prophylaxis, a different therapy should be used. Artemisinin combination therapies, hydroxychloroquine, quinine plus doxycycline, tetracycline, or clindamycin are all listed as options. And for anti-relapse therapy, he will require the additional treatment of hypnozoites with either primaquine or tifenoquine. The lack of significant anemia is what has caused me the greatest hesitation in choosing malaria as my answer. Regardless, I learned a lot in my readings, in suspense, <laughs> and always in great appreciation, Kamona. Wow. Uh, I think Christina, right? Hmm, yep. Christopher writes, hi Twipsters. This case had me writing differentials up on my whiteboard for about an hour now. As a good rule of thumb, any person who has traveled to a malaria endemic region who returns with recurring fevers has malaria until proven otherwise. My guess is an incipient P. falciparum infection as we see marginally low hemoglobin, thrombocytopenia and daily fevers. P. falciparum infection is often described as tertian fever, which is a fever occurring every second day. However, early in its infection, the protozoan may still have not adjusted its circadian rhythm. The associated stress of malaria infection may have caused an outbreak of herpes simplex that could explain the lesions on the penis. I would say this is just hand, just hand waving at this point. It is a tough case. And that's Christopher from the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Dixon. Yes, sir. Kevin writes, hello, TWIP team. It is currently, albeit unpredictably, a sunny but windy 61F, 16C in St. Louis, where we are rounding second on spring, and baseball season is in full bloom. My evaluation regarding the rambling gadabout with fevers, rash, and cough is that this person is experiencing a recurrence of infection with the protozoan of the genus Plasmodium, i.e. malaria. There are a number of findings in this case which point to malaria and a number which are misleading. First, his recent travel to multiple tropical countries with a relatively high incidence of malaria, where he was bitten by multiple insects, in quotes, and presents with a recurring fever months apart, indicate that this diagnosis should be high on any differential. The doxycycline resolved a previous illness, the thrombocytopenia, and the normal white blood cell count and eosinophil count provide further support. HIV should always be a concern, but the H&E uh, lessens this possibility, I think. I believe the finding of his eating habits is misleading, 
because I would suspect other parasites to cause more intense symptoms, eosinophilia or digestive issues in presentation. I also think the fly bite on his hip is deceptive. My th first thought here is around leishmaniasis, but I would expect a different timeline on present or presentation with something like the cutaneous or visceral form of this disease. Finally, the skin findings on his genitals are not specific and may or may not connect to this diagnosis. There are two primary methods for diagnosing malaria based on my readings. The first is a classic, Geem-sustained blood smear, and I would order it. This test could confirm a diagnosis, identify which species are responsible, and gauge the severity of parasitemia. If the initial smear comes up negative, new specimens should be drawn every six hours if suspicion is high, though I do not know for how long. The second method is a rapid antibody-based test that does not require a microscopist, but can be poorly specific and sensitive for the species of P. nolzai. I am not sure which is preferable in practice. If confirmed, I would follow up with a PCR test to identify the infection uh, if the infection is drug resistant. This step would be critical in determining the course of treatment. If there is a positive result, this would not be unexpected as this patient has had a recurrence of infection after prophylaxis and drug resistant species of P. falciparum and P. vivax have been well documented in forested regions of Southeast Asia. Treatment selection is based on severity of presentation, species, and drug susceptibility. Severely, severe malaria is treated with chinchona alkaloids or artemisinin and derivatives and can be treated with quinidine, but seems to require extensive monitoring and tracking of the patient. It is unclear that this patient has or is developing a severe form of the disease. For non-complicated malaria, the treatment of choice depends on where the patient would have acquired the disease. But in this case, because chloroquine resistance is so prevalent, artemisinin and combina combination therapy is preferred. Looking forward to more episodes that I guess you should add and the actual diagnosis of this infection. Hey, Al, you're next. Yes, so uh, Omar writes, Salam, esteemed doctors. We are in the midst of the holy months of Ramadan, and as you well know, fasting is internal to our practice during this month. So you will forgive any lapses in my email. It is late in the evening as I type this email, so I suspect I'm a bit hypoglycemic, and I'm eagerly awaiting the time to break the fast. I write to you from the sleepy coastal town in Tanzania called Bagam Bagamoyo, where we are bracing for the onset of our biannual rainy season called Masika, and the cases of complicated malaria it drags in with it. I work in the clinical trial center of a research, research institution I have a clinical background being a trained medical doctor, a relatively fresh one, I should add. Here we have and continue to conduct phase one clinical trials on a number of malaria vaccines, pre-erythrocytic, blood stage, and transmission blocking vaccines, including the RH5, R21, PFS25 vaccines, and a few others. Professor Emeritus de Palmier, will be interested to hear that we are tra tra trailblazers in the field of malaria challenge studies in Africa. We conducted the first ever liver stage challenge in a malaria endemic country in Africa right here back in 2016. And recently, I was the primary clinician in the first blood stage malaria challenge in semi-immune African adults that we only just completed squeaky bum stuff. We are also evaluating vaccines against rabies and Ebola that utilize adenovirus vector. On to the young man who presents with fever after venturing to Guinea and Thailand. This is Papua New Guinea. I straight away suspected a case of malaria, probably because it makes up roughly 40 to 60% of the cases I see around this time of year with P. vivex being the culprit and seeing as it is endemic in Southeast Asia, this further raises my suspicion. 
Doxycycline is a capable schizonticidal, and that is why it resulted in relief in, of his clinical symptoms after admis- administration. But lest we forget, P. vivex is notorious for its dormant hypnozoite stage in the liver, and this must explain the relapse after returning to Israel owing to weak gametocidal effect of the drug. A thin blood smear would be ideal for identifying the species of plas- plasmodium. This is this after a rapid test to diagnose malaria initially. The findings of mild thrombocytopenia and borderline hemoglobin value are also in keeping with a malaria diagnosis, though I would have also expected to see mild leukocytopenia as well. I suppose a PCR would also satisfy the the purpose, but is overkill for this case. We routinely use this in our clinical trials, though. Treatment should be with an artemisinin-based therapy. A three-day course of artemeter lumefantrine should do the trick, but... The young man should also be prescribed a star dose of primaquine as a gametocidal. This should be given after establishing the patient's G6PD status, since the drug comes with a potential for hemolysis in deficient individuals, something we practice with all trial participants in malaria challenge studies before we clear them of the infection. That being said, I am in the process of finalizing a fellowship for the WHO CRD TDR fellowship program, which I plan to undertake with Medicine for Malaria Venture, MMV in Geneva, Switzerland. And I do not know if any of the esteemed doctors have affiliations there. If so, it would be a great opportunity for me to meet and be inspired. Please do give me a shout should any of you ever find yourself in Tanzania in the future, plenty of beautiful national parks, and I would be happy to show you around our research center and introduce you to all the exciting work we do, including our entomology unit, yours humbly, Omar. I have to agree, Tanzania is beautiful. I visited exactly one year ago with my kids, did a beautiful safari and Highly recommend. Right. <laughs> I'm just booking my flights. I've actually been to Bagamoyo, believe it or not, in 1988. Wow. <laughs> All right, Daniel writes. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel. I found the you last case. that so well. Yeah, it's very easy. <laughs> I found the last case very interesting and challenging. Please keep them coming. The 24-year-old male presenting with an acute febrile illness and thrombocytopenia returning from his travels brings to mind a wide differential, including malaria, yellow fever, Zika, tick bite fever, dengue, chikungunya, meningococcal meningitis, leptospirosis, and viral hepatitis. The puritic rash dry cough and long incubation period of three weeks narrows the broad differential. Cutaneous larva migrants results in a serpiginous puritic rash and can have an incubation period of over a month. Scabies can result in pruritic rash and can result in nodulopapular lesions on the genitals. Trichinellosis can result in pruritic rash and cough after consumption of undercooked meat. Strongylodiasis can cause cough and rash. Nanthostomiasis can cause pruritic skin lesions and fever three to four weeks after ingestion of raw or undercooked meat. I found it difficult to tie in the penile vesicles. I think this could possibly be a red herring. Possibly this is reactivation of latent herpes or uh, herpes simplex due to immunosuppression from his acute illness. Of the differentials, I think tick bite fever is less likely as he was treated with five days of docs for a febrile illness, possibly for TBF, as he had a lesion on his hip, which was slow to heal, which could be an Eschar. Tick bite fever also has an incubation period of eight days while his illness presented three weeks after returning from Thailand. Yellow fever has an incubation period three to seven days, so also this does not fit. He's also likely have been vaccinated for this prior to travel. Dengue, too, has a short incubation period, five to seven days. Malaria nulsi can have an incubation period up to 21 days and is endemic to Thailand, so I would want to exclude this with a malaria rapid test and thick and thin blood smears. My guess is hookworm infection. In particular, Encelostoma salanicum, 
Hookworms can cause papular vesicular lesions at their point of entry, anemia and dermatitis, as well as respiratory symptoms if the worm burden is high. Diagnosis would be by stool microscopy. It is a wild stab in the dark. I am perplexed by this case. Thank you for your intriguing cases. Kind regards, Daniel. Wow. Back to you, Dixon. James writes, so in summary, a 24-year-old male with fever and itchy rash, dry cough, traveled to India, Papua New Guinea, Thailand, and Israel, multiple insect bites, swimming in rivers, eating regular food, took malaria prophylaxis in New Guinea, but quit it in Thailand. PE, vesicles on penis, itchy, WBC is normal, minimally low, minimally low and RBCs and pits. No eosinophilia. (laughs) Protozoa. Daily fever times four days is a little weird for malaria. That is the least zebra of the protozoal in possibilities. P. nolzai can can do daily fevers, comes from monkeys, and is an endemic in Southeast Asia. Fits pretty well. Blood films look a lot like falciparum. And a lot of medical folks don't even know about Noel's eye. I teach it to my DO medical students. There is a PCR, I believe. This is probably my favorite and leading uh, diagnosis. Your cryptic comment about giving the most precise um, differential diagnosis fits this as well. It can be a serious infection. Sometimes malaria can have petechiae or purpura or other rashes, but this is less common. Other malarias are possible, and maybe the fever, and maybe the fever hasn't settled on its rhythm. Blood film again, and maybe other molecular tests. Lishmania probably belongs on the list. Skin symptoms a lot more common. Fever, okay. Nasty hip bite is a decent history item as well. Trypanosomes seem unlikely. Luminal gastrointestinal protozoan is a stretch, I think. Worms? No is an affiliate and a soft negative here is a soft negative here. When I was a fresh, young, naive MD PhD at Duke, I just equated eosinophils with parasites. But in my path residency, well they're not so fast, dude. <laughs> Drug reactions, allergies, there are even eosinophilic leukemias. Still in all, tissue worms often have eosinophils. I guess I'd consider schistosomes from swimming, various filarial nematodes from bites, etc. I still like Noel's eye. I wonder if the vessels are herpetic. Condoms are not nearly 100% effective for viral diseases. Hmm. That was an interesting uh, read. All right, there there you go. We had a nice bunch of of guesses. And uh, anything else we need to consider here? Yes, there is. <laughs> you have oh, a, like another half guesses. hour's worth of clinical <laughs> results to give. <count. laughs> yeah, we have a few more guesses here. Uh, did Dixon, you know, being the senior individual, shall I let you go first? You are. I like. If, if you'd like me to step off that cliff, I'll be glad to. Um, <laughs> And I, and I guess yeah, I was so, thinking about this professor. Um, um, yeah, when I say that, I guess who am I referring to? Um, yes, should we yeah, all yeah. guess before we get any more information so we have the same playing field yeah, as our so. emailers? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. So um, my first impression was you have to do more tests before you can give a reasonable guess as to what this is. But if you had to do or die and make this in the jungles of Papua New Guinea because this guy is suffering greatly from it. And you just have to make a wild guess. I'm going to pick two different parasites. I'm going to pick uh, visceral leishmaniasis. I like the hip lesion that that cleared up. That's visceral leishmania type of a lesion that doesn't stick around very long. And the parasites become systemic and they end up, end up in the bone marrow and spleen. And uh, we don't have any data on that, so we can't guess further than my speculation. But I would like to know further information on the the kinds of fever, because Leishmania has a double hump in the middle of each day's fever. And if that double hump isn't there, then maybe that would rule that out. The other one, of course, is Prasmodium nolzi, which has uh, no rhythmic (laughs) or or biorhythmic 
three to five or four to three or two to one, whatever their whatever their uh, patterns are in primates other than humans. Certainly when it gets into humans, it's abnormal. And uh, a fever every day from P. Noel's eye has uh, been described many times and low thrombocytes also many times. So if I had to choose, I'd choose those two. And unfortunately, they each require different drugs. So I would reach into my magic pouch on the back of my hiking uh, equipment and pull out both of those drugs to treat um, the uh, lishmaniasis with and the p eye with and hope for the best. But uh, I need some more tests to really give a better answer. Okay. Who's up next? I'm not guessing because I've already <laughs> had the case no discussion. The <laughs> Vincent, you want to go and then I'm going to... I think this is some kind of malaria, some kind of plasmodium. And I think the test... Uh, should be designed to distinguish that. Uh, I think the fever for me, and he's also in an area where this is uh, is uh, high malaria. So that's what I like. All right, I'll jump in. So, um, I, you know, first off, I will say I I am not certain what it is. Um, and I'm definitely not certain on which, you know, which subspecies it might be. Um, but I'll tell you my guess, and then I'll go through why I think it is. So, so I'm going to go with Schistosomiasis mansoni, mm. um, and I'm going to go with the hypersensitivity um, form of this disease. And let me tell you sort of how I got there so I can embarrass myself publicly. Um, so here's why I think this is. So, um, you know, the, I think I've said this many times, fever in a returning traveler is malaria until proven otherwise. Um, and sure, I think that's definitely in the differential. Um, a couple of things bothered me about malaria, though. Um, one was, okay, yeah, he's got the low platelets, um, but he's got a normal white blood cell count. His hemoglobin's fine. Um, so that, that doesn't really work well for me with um, falciparum, with Nolzai, maybe Vivax, maybe partially treated Vivax. Okay, so certainly one of the first tests I would want to do is let's get a blood smear. Let's really make sure this isn't malaria before we, we miss malaria. But then I'm going to move on a little farther from that. Um, so what about schistosomiasis? Why, why am I considering schistosomiasis um, and potentially about three to four weeks during the migratory in a person who doesn't have eosinophilia? And I think that's where I'm going to go with this subvariant. Of, there's a subvariant of schistosomiasis where the inoculum is not huge, right? Catayama fever is usually a large inoculum. You get a massive eosinophilia. You get all this pulmonary. You get all the eosinophilia. Um, but there's a hypersensitivity variant where when they reach that point, they get rash, they get vesicles, they get fever. Um, they can get thrombocytopenia. Um, white count doesn't necessarily go up because it's hypersensitivity. Um, hemoglobin stays fine. Um, all right, that's, but I would, what would I like to know at this point? Um, yes, of course, we want that blood smear. Um, yes, I want some serology testing um, and certainly some other testing as well. So, all right, that's what I'm going with. All right, well, uh, yeah. I wouldn't have had a clue had I not known. Yeah. Yeah, so we uh, um, so obviously this is a call from the emergency room. It's a weekend. You're not there. And we tell them as, as uh, I tell them as Daniel, uh, I, I have a, a, an idea because we've had several travelers from Papua New Guinea present in a very similar way. Uh, and I tell them uh, as we do malaria, uh, I, I would say, you know, fever in a return traveler is always malaria until proven otherwise as Daniel mentioned and as you both said you would really be keen on seeing the smears so i asked the emergency room to send a rapid detection test and comes back uh, positive to non falciparum malaria and in the thin smear which i go there and see we see very low parasitemia um a very rare single amoeboid uh, you know trophozoids in enlarged distorted red cells some schofner dots so this is a, a you want to guess, this is a, a classic uh, Vivex malaria. And what we, so the diagnosis was plasmodium, plasmodium Vivex malaria, which was acquired probably in Papua New Guinea. And it was delayed 
uh, onset of vivex malaria, which is a very, which is a rather common presentation in in travelers, and I thought that that was a uh, uh, that is a good uh, uh, um, I would say take home message that uh, despite this traveler having taken. Uh, Atovacuan Poguanil, Malaron, during his time in Papua New Guinea, he did end up developing a delayed onset of Vivex malaria because uh, because of uh, uh, lack of activity of, of uh, Malaron on the hypnozoites. So uh, obviously several take-home messages here. One, one is that, you know, our travelers have not read the textbook. So their fever is not... It's, uh, many travelers do not come with a tertian or a quartan fever. They will come with daily fever. Many of them do not have uh, anemia, do not have a low hemoglobin when they present with, with malaria. They actually could have a normal white count and, and differential and a normal uh, uh, hemoglobin. But thrombocytopenia, low plated count, is a very common presentation of, of, of uh, malaria in travelers. And the other Red herring, so that were mentioned, his uh, uh, itchy rash on his uh, glance penis, which was uh, obviously a herpetic rash, and his uh, insect bite. You'll see tons of insect bites from people that hike on the, on the jungle. Uh, so they have not read the textbook. They have different symptoms, and you have to stick to the epidemiology which is the key factor here. And, and if you look at, at uh, reports of malaria in travelers, You'll see both reports. There's a New England journal that was really published from our center from Sheba back in, the, in uh, 2003 about delayed onset of malaria and implications on chemoprophylaxis. And you can just read the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, which is the surveillance report the CDC publishes about malaria every year. So, for example, in 2018, there were about uh, 1,800 malaria cases in the U.S. of return travelers, imported malaria. Of those, about 10% were Vivex malaria. But of these Vivex malaria cases, the majority were diagnosed more than a month after they returned. So Vivex malaria is common in travelers that took a tovacuon proguanil or other uh, uh, blood stage prophylactics and uh, and uh, will present sometimes more than a month after they left the malarious region. I have a Maybe question. The Hang on. are coming out oh. then. Sorry, sorry, you go, uh, Dixon. Then I'm going to ask. No, I was going to say maybe maybe it's not a um, a late onset. Maybe it's a relapse. And maybe he was treated with doxycycline and um, and the proguanol, uh, and and then wiped out the blood stages, but it wouldn't touch the hypnozoids. So then. Absolutely. Another, another it's, three it's, weeks, out come the hypnozoites, and up comes another uh, blood stage, and now you're not treating it. And the next thing you know, you've got a fever. Absolutely. So we know that uh, most malaria prophylactic drugs uh, treat only the blood right. forms, so uh, chloroquine, uh, mefloquine, and uh, atovacuan poguanil does have some liver stage uh, activity, but not against the hypnozoites. Right. So it's right. still only about 85% right. effective in preventing Vivex malaria, compared with a higher effectiveness in preventing uh, falsipa so malaria. What is the treat? So it's absolutely... What, and, yes. and you had a question at the very end of that case that sort of indicated that there was Vivax because you said, now, what else do you have to know about this patient before you treat? Because if you treat a patient with G6PD deficiency for the liver stages, it's going to exacerbate uh, another hemolytic anemia. So you have to know whether that's there to begin with. And so it was another hint. It was a pretty... Um, deeply embedded hint into the case histories, I must say. But, but yeah, that was a great case history. That was really terrific. Thank you very much. So I wanted to know, did you follow G chat GPT's advice and actually biopsy the man's penis, or did you gently swab <laughs> a vesicle and send it off for PCR? So the, the, the most common vesicular rash we see in return travelers is, of course, hookworm-related uh, cutanea larva ah. migrants. And if you biopsy the vesicles, you will never the find yeah, the larva right. there. The larva has already left 
the 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 rush so our uh, you know the take home message here is don't buy up see kutanela variants and and generally speaking stick to epidemiology yeah. it would give you the most common causes and 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 uh, there you'll find the uh, i would say a rare presentation of a common disease is still more common than a, a rare presentation of a yeah, rare I disease. I hope chat GPT doesn't advise too many people to do bi- penile uh, <laughs> biopsies. <so. laughs> I suppose maybe chat GP I is going to be virtually. listening to Twitter. <laughs> That's see? what I'm hoping. Chat, this is what yeah, and then they'll enough. learn that. Please uh, <laughs> use epidemiology, maybe a PCR, but let's, uh, let's really step back on the, uh, the biopsies, please. The invasion, uh, invasive tests, I forget yeah. about that. <laughs> All right. Al, do you want to say a few words about plasmodium nolsi? Because quite a few yeah. people brought that up. And I, right. I think it's not really something that we have talked about much, haven't we? We have not. Yeah. Um, described by, I believe, a Malaysian group uh, led by uh, Singh in, uh, in uh, the Malaysia part of uh, Borneo, I think. Uh, it's, it's really a, 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 a monkey malaria parasite that due to deforestation has kind of drifted into the human popul- mm. population uh, of uh, Malaysian Borneo. It causes uh, severe malaria. It's a bit uh, difficult to dis- distinguish in microscopy from, uh, uh, from P. Uh, uh, malaria. I think it's very similar on the smears and it was then differentiated by the severe clinical presentation, which is not uh, typical for plasmodium malaria. Uh, it's rather rare in travelers, only a handful of cases. So this, uh, this CDC report of malaria, I think, diagnosed only one case in 2018. So, it's, you know, an interesting parasite, but, but a, a, a rare one. You'll see a lot of literature, but you wouldn't see it as often in travelers as you would see uh, Vivex and certainly the most common in travelers, the falciparum. But c- certainly an interesting parasite and, uh, um, yeah, and the uh, travel in Papua New Guinea is, is, uh, is, uh, would be a, a risk. I would also say that uh, some of the responders mentioned the, uh, the traveler being off prophylaxis in Thailand Um, about 250,000 Israelis go to Thailand every year, and we rarely seen malaria imported from Thailand over the last few years. So the risk is probably very low and probably from rural places, perhaps bordering northern uh, Thailand, uh, Myanmar and, and uh, uh, Cambodia, Lao maybe, but not very common in travelers returning from uh, Thailand as uh, compared with Papua, which is a very high risk of uh, malaria. And uh, in fact, the first case of uh, chloroquine-resistant plasmodium vivax was reported in an Australian that uh, went to Papua New Guinea, came back, and when they diagnosed vivax, they gave chloroquine and seen a a very slow uh, response. And that's where uh, chloroquine resistance was first described in plasmodium uh, vivax. In the late 80s, it was uh, almost 30 years or 40 years after it was described in Plasmodium falciparum. And if you really want to get um, confused fast, all you have to do is pick up uh, PCC Garnham's book on malaria and look through it and find out exactly how many different kind of malarias there really are because there are many, many kinds and all of the non-human primates have their own species And I, I guess the orangutan serves as the primary host, perhaps, for P. Olsai. I don't know of that for sure, but it sounds like it might be a, a target for that particular parasite. But, um, yeah, this was uh, really – this was great. Absolutely great. <laughs> It's good to have challenging – Cases sometimes, right. I suppose. I no, suppose Vincent, <laughs> you're always liking in us to the car talk guys, and this is one of those that would have been called <laughs> Stump the Chumps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the and toughest we, one we've ever had, don't you think? That is. I think so, is. yeah. It may But have you know, not been presented all that great by myself. So no, I was no, kind no. of thinking, oh, maybe I've emphasized the red herrings a bit too strongly. So no, no, that's part of the game. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the patients don't read the textbooks, right? They come in probably mm -hmm. in his mind, the vesicles on the penis is his primary. And by the way, I have a fever, right? We're always like, okay, we know what your primary concern is, but my <laughs> primary concern. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, time exactly. to give away a book here. We had 10 yep. eligible guesses. Let's pick a random number between 1 <clears throat> and 10. Number 8. Rich. Number eight. Let's see who number eight is. Number eight is Omar in in uh, yes Bagamoyo. Oh boy. Yes. And so where is Geneva. Bagamoyo? Do you do you know Christina? Well, it was definitely on the east She's coast of there. Tanzania. I've been there. I couldn't place it on the map, but it was quite as well. It was 1988, so it was a small place back then, but it was beautifully located straight on on the Atlantic coast. Uh, I think it was coastal north, coastal north of Dar es Salaam, but I, I would have to okay. look at the map, really. It has been a long time ago. Cool. All right, Omar, please uh, send your address and telephone to twip at microbe.tv. We'll and come visit you. We will come visit <laughs> you. We and, will. Uh, <laughs> we will. Um, Hand deliver. <laughs> I, oopsie, a visit. I just today, Daniel. I got invited by somebody in Australia who who works for Pfizer to go there. Oh wow! Really? Yeah, we were invited to Khartoum, but I'm going to put that off a little bit. So. Mm. I, yes, Why is that? I would wait till the dust settles. Uh, th things are things are not so great. Um, yeah, in the Sudan right now, it's yeah. not so oh, great. Okay. Right. Well, yeah, but you, you probably remember all those books we sent to University of Khartoum. So, oh yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, now's not a I great saw that time. On Twitter. Thoughts Maybe, and prayers um, to our friends there. Dixon, you don't have a hero today, right? I'm sorry, I don't. And you know what I would suggest is that we ask our listenership to send in suggestions, and then we will pick what we think is an appropriate hero, and we'll put it on. Maybe I'm, could I pick a hero? Sure, you could. Uh, I pick Dixon de Pommier. No, no, no. I think no, we've no, already no. done that. <laughs> no, you haven't. No, I, I would know. Believe me, I would know. Okay. <laughs> no, you don't want to do that. Yeah, I'm going to do it. You can't tell me what to do. Yeah, you can do I it next time. To do. We'll tell our, you know, ah, why on. Why don't people email in why we should pick Dixon as our hero? <laughs> He's being overly nice to Dixon right now. No, Dixon, <laughs> you know, I, I, so, uh, um, Al, I don't know if you know this, but Dixon was my parasitology professor when That's I true. went to medical school <laughs> well into last century. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, uh, hey, Al, yes. can you, he remembered everything I said, too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 can you uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, Al? Like where you're obviously from yeah, Israel, please. but uh, what you studied and uh, what you do now would be fun. Yeah, so I, I studied in uh, Israel's Institute of Technology. Israel has an interesting uh, combination. One of its universities is an Institute of Technology called the Technion in Haifa, in the north of Israel. And they have a medical school, so that's where I went to medical school. Trained in Sheba Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in, in Israel, one of the largest in the Middle East, over 2,000 patient beds. Um, and that's where I did internal medicine and infectious disease, but I became interested in travel medicine, tropical medicine, and uh, went and spent uh, half a year in Nepal, in Kathmandu, doing some, practicing some travel medicine in, a, in a, um, one of the clinics and studying altitude sickness, which Nepal would be a good place to study. Went back to Israel, and then I... Uh, did a, um, a fellowship after I finished infectious disease called Epidemic Intelligence Service. And it's a CDC training that uh, trains uh, clinicians to do public health work on the job training. And there I focused on uh, viral gastroenteritis. So did a lot of surveillance work and vaccine effectiveness work, um, both in West Africa, some work in Haiti and some other countries. And, uh, and came back to Israel to work in clinical uh, infectious disease, travel in tropical medicine, and uh, still do some academic and public health work, mostly in uh, vaccine-preventable diseases, um, um, and, and uh, see a lot of travelers. In, in our center, we see about 1,000 travelers a year 
post-travel, returning travelers, and uh, we prepare about 10,000 travelers that come all they go and uh, visit overseas to get vaccines and some uh, uh, education, some uh, pills to take with them. Um, we, we have about 100 hospitalizations of travelers every year, and about, I would say, 60 to 70 percent of them are mm-hmm. malaria. So practically, I see a malaria patient every one or two weeks, um, and almost all of them are travelers. And travelers have a slightly different presentation than, than uh, people who live in endemic uh, malaria countries. They are not semi-immune, they are completely non-immune. And so you see slightly different uh, 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 clinical presentation lab tests as, as you could see from the case uh, we presented. So overall, uh, I really like my work, both the public health part, the vaccines, more of a viral vaccines, uh, so <laughs> would fit another podcast. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, mostly viral gastroenteritis, rotavirus vaccines, huge work that was done over the last two decades and uh, huge declines in disease burden in, in, uh, in low-income countries where child mortality from diarrhea is very high. So these vaccines are very effective in, in preventing uh, child mortality from from diarrhea, and uh, I also like my clinical work with the uh, travelers. And you forgot to mention that you're also doing some teaching on our diploma in tropical <laughs> medicine and hygiene. <laughs> yes, I was fortunate to be Christina's student in the Glasgow University DTMH when I decided it was time to get the official, uh, you know, both the, the, the base of knowledge which you have to to acquire to sit for this uh, the royal college exam and the, the i have to say that the glasgow university course was Great. fantastic now, when did you take that course Eyal? it was 2018 i think uh 2018 or 2019 okay. yeah 2018 was that the year you came on board as I well i was Daniel? on board so uh yeah, yeah. so you know, i think you I'm didn't come to the january for all team. your success <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I don't think al you weren't at the january teaching week weren't you oh, have you ever visited the uh, american yeah. society for tropical medicine and hygiene meeting I must say I never, never uh, went to the ASTMH. I was considering the upcoming Chicago meeting. Um, we will be, we will be there. We'll buy so you dinner if I, you show up. <laughs> <laughs> I might hold you on that. So, so Daniel, we're on, we're on for Chicago. We're on for Chicago. <laughs> Can we yeah, do? We, uh, we registered. We're doing a booth. Maybe we'll even do some TWIP uh, recording. I think we there. should do like last time a TWIP and a TWIV clinical update. That would be great. Um, so you you're registering for all of us, Daniel? Yes. All right. Yes, so I'll just gotcha. make my oh, plane covered. reservation. Oh, good. That was I, I enjoyed that meeting, except for yeah, the so getting. Yeah. Co- I was gonna I was gonna ask one of the things. I think it's interesting. I mean, so you know, I've probably seen most of my malaria overseas, right? Because you know, you go and you know, you see a dozen a day when you're in some of these clinics in Africa. So it's it's hard to like see more, you know, in the U.S. and travelers. Um, but it really, I think, as you point out, it presents very differently. Like in Africa, people, it's enough time that you start to see these sort of fever patterns where in travelers, it's quite different. But I think it's interesting. We don't, we don't really teach travelers malaria. We still are sort of, I think, obsessed with the, the Greek patterns, right? Um, mm-hmm. And it's, I think it's important, right, to, to realize that you don't need a cyclic fever. You don't need that six hours and recurring at a certain interval fever and a returning traveler, as I think this reminds everyone, um, you know, even though I'm trying to think of some really exotic, rare things that, you know, it's fever and a returning traveler, 70% of the time, it's going to be right. malaria. Right. I yelled, in that patient that we just covered, uh, what was the spleen like? Well, you know, m- m- many clinici- clinicians still, you know, do this very nice uh, show of palpating and tapping <laughs> for the spleen. They can't find it, right? <laughs> but if you, don't, if, no, if, you, if you don't have the ultrasound, the chances of you actually, you, you would feel a huge spleen. So when you, when you examine a Kalazar patient or a chronic schisto patient, you, you're going to feel that spleen. But with a malaria patient or infectious mono that sometimes you could 
palpate the tip of the spleen, you know, peeking down from the ribs, and sometimes not. It's okay. not very sensitive. And he didn't, he didn't need to undergo any imaging. So I can't tell you what his, what his spleen was the, like. It wasn't anything that I could... I think that's I also a distinction, the traveler endemic. When you're in the, you know, little kid comes in, four-year-old, and, you know, I, I usually, I do the scratch, right, where I put the stethoscope over and I could sort of scratch it out and it helps me find the edge. But, yeah, no, I mean, in the returning traveler, you, the spleen is, you know, even, you know, boy, we scan everyone in the U.S., by the way. Um, you don't always see that big spleen. So it's, it's a different presentation. And I think, again, we still teach the sub-Saharan presentation, and then most of our students never see that. They see the returning traveler, and right. yeah. So you just have to kind of hammer in, you know, get that blood smear, get that rapid test, don't move exactly. forward until you address the potential malaria issue. Were you ever close to taking a bone marrow? <laughs> oh, in this tempted? patient, or? In, in, the, in, the, in the, for what well, diagnosis? For visceral osteoriasis. Uh, the last patient, oh, this is a fascinating story. Um, this was an Israeli that hiked the Pacific Trail, uh, the Pacific Crest Trail for six months, and he develops a fever in Guatemala. And they call me and I say he has a fever in Guatemala. These are two red herrings, but he just finished the Pacific Crest Trail. It's a young 20-year-old, healthy Israeli, he remains febrile for two weeks as he's making his way to Israel with pancytopenia and a large spleen. And we do all the workout. We find nothing except a large spleen that has a nice uh, uh, um, uh, enhancement on a PET CT. The only thing that enhances is his spleen and he's completely pancytopenic and febrile for three weeks. And I decide, you know, we have to tap his spleen. And that's where we find a, a Lishmania a, a infantum that he acquired okay. in Israel. <laughs> so it's a visceral Lishmaniasis he acquired wow. in Israel. Hiked the whole Pacific Crest Trail with Lishmania and presented. And, and it, it drove me crazy because this case was all red herring. No, no. Because obviously, Kal Azar is very rare in Israel. Lishmania infantum does cause visceral lishmaniasis in Israel, but it's very rare. We see a handful of cases in the whole country every year. And I thought his risk was because most people will clear the parasite, will not develop Kal Azar, even if they're bitten by a sand fly. But this patient, hiking for three months, must have put him in some sort of immunodeficiency. It was, you know, it's, it's a very long hike. He must have been in some state of hunger at this point, became Altitude immunodeficient sickness. and Altitude developed sickness. the disease. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's the altitude or the lack of nutrition, but it, this day still, it, the uh, case still wow. baffles me. But we didn't diagnose on, on bone marrow. Sweet. We diagnosed on a, a, liver. a liver biopsy and a PCR was positive. A spleen biopsy, I'm sorry. Right. A spleen biopsy. Mm. We tapped his spleen, right. yeah. And there we are, two wow. interesting <laughs> cases on one trip. Yeah. <laughs> well, one leads to the other because, I mean, if you don't get Schistosoma mansoni, <laughs> then, it, then maybe it's got something to do with it. That's why I was asking about the spleen and the liver and that sort of thing. Because, you know, when you teach this, of course, you teach classic pa patterns. and But nothing is classic when someone has taken that many different prophylaxis drugs, been treated for fevers, been in five different countries. We had one patient that on one of our cases that had been to like 10 different countries and they were all tropical. And, and so which one do you pick? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a, you cause a twine in the air and you just have to do the tests. That's all. Hey, all I should you ask, have you seen that, that presentation that I was describing of the, um, the schistosomiasis hypersensitivity where they yeah. get Absolutely. Um, we actually, um, this is a very interesting case. So we've seen uh, quite a few of them coming from Tanzania uh -huh. and from Africa where, where uh, acute schistosomiasis is, is a very common presentation. Almost all of them will present with an That's eosinophilia, right. a, a dry cough and a, a weakness is very common. Serology would be negative uh, during the acute presentation. It may only become positive uh, four, six weeks after exposure, sometimes even later. 
So serology is not a good uh, tool, and fever mm-hmm. is not universal. So only about 70 to 80 percent of them are, are febrile. But the interesting case happened when a family came back from Laos and Cambodia, and they went to another hospital with a, a, their kids had a febrile illness. And the other hospital did a rapid detection test, a malaria rapid detection test. They came back positive, diagnosed malaria. But these kids had the eosinophilia of a, a, almost 2,000, which we almost never see in malaria patients. So they came to us. We did the full workup for malaria. We did another rapid detection test, which was negative. And smears and PCR were all negative. And this was a false positive rapid detection test. We described it on, on uh, 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 that uh, acute uh, schistosomiasis caused by uh, mm. schistomekongi, which is prevalent in, in Lao uh, uh, region, may cause false positive rapid detection test for malaria. Um, and, and this is described, this is one of the two or three causes of false positive rapid detection tests. So we see quite a few acute schisto, and actually I presented these cases in Japan, and one of the listeners to this uh, presentation stood up and said, I uh, thank you, Eyal, for presenting these cases, because when I wrote the text to call the textbook on schistomekongi, I wrote that schistomekongi never causes acute schistosomiasis, <laughs> and I was wrong. <laughs> so we, we do see it, and travelers teach us a lot about yeah. tropical diseases because we get to have a very uh, close monitored look at the clinical presentation. We can look at the lab tests in a way that sometimes not uh, possible in low uh, income settings or in more uh, uh, yeah. field settings. So we can learn a lot from travelers, both on the clinical and also on the epidemiology of, of uh, uh, tropical diseases because travelers also serve as uh, yeah. sentinels. So they teach us which yeah, diseases are Yeah, that was the old teaching well. was only Mansonai causes the Kadayama or even the hypersensitivity. But mm. yeah, and if you don't look, you're going to just sort of have that circular Actually, reasoning. And I think also like everything was <laughs> falciparum until we started having the ability to look for other things. Was, you know, 10% of the time it's not. So yeah. If I could just add a little note here, though, Daniel, the Katayama fever was named in Japan, and that's uh, Japan, Shustasoma Japanicum. Yeah, which would which would really so you'd sort of say, why were you teaching that it was only yeah, <laughs> yeah Manson? That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So interesting, right? Yep. All right. Speaking of cases, Daniel, you have any more? I nah. I do. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is a case from one of my colleagues in Northwest China. Um, so many, many years ago, when I was asked to, take it, to teach at Kunming University, I shared this on TWIV 1000. I had this plan to climb the beautiful Tian Shan Mountains. And again, a second time when I ended up distracted at the southern edge of the Gobi Desert uh, in a Tibetan monastery instead. But all right, stories for another day. Let me get right into this one. <laughs> um, this is the case of a man right around age 30 years old and he presents with right lower extremity weakness, numbness, and issues with bowel and bladder function. Um, Get a little more history um, from my friend. Um, When he was just a few years old, he had reported dog exposure. I mean, a few years. I mean, like two, three, four, like very young, um, but none since then. And when he was young, he actually had a lesion in his liver that was removed. Maybe that's a clue. Um, No reported dog exposure since those first few years of his life. Uh, Now, he is found on exam to have a mass in the right upper buttock. It's actually, it's palpable, it's visual, it's visible. Um, His white blood cell count is normal, but his erythrocyte sedimentation, right, his CRP, is also elevated. So ESR is elevated, CRP, C-reactive protein are elevated. Um, They go ahead and they do a CT scan, a CAT scan, even though he had dog exposure, that was a joke, which reveals (laughs) cystic (laughs) lesions and significant destruction of L5 down into the sacrum and coccyx. 
Sorry, I laughed with delay because it took me a while to, <laughs> to, you know, Daniel, to get the joke. Shit. If you hadn't said dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, AL is giving people, they've got generic pet scans over there in Israel. We, we do cat scans, but no dog scans. That's right. <laughs> well, so we have different sets of pets, that's all. <laughs> so what is this dog exposure, Daniel? Um, and that was all I got from my colleague. And I think that's all we need to know is that, that you know, is he has not needs. had any. I think this is interesting. You know, here's here's this gentleman uh, who has uh, right around the age of 30. We're talking about 25 plus years ago. There was a dog exposure. Who knows right. if that's relevant or not? There was a cystic lesion that was addressed in the liver. And now this individual has this destructive um, process in the lower uh, spine, which is actually having neurological uh, manifestations, and there are cystic lesions that are seen on the imaging. Mm. So mm. what could be going on in Northwest China? Well, <laughs> chat GPT has given me some clues. I'm on it, man. What do we do next? Oh, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. no, no biopsies of any, you know, Okay. Anything, but Daniel, um, this is not your case, so I can't ask you any questions. Right? <laughs> well, that's all you're getting. That's all I'm that's getting. That's all I'm getting. Boy, um, in the old days, I used to be get. able to ask you questions. That's you want to ask a few questions? I'll, I'll give you some answers if you want to jump in. So, so he's this gentleman is HIV negative. Uh -huh. um, we're not getting any report of any toxic habits. So, no alcohol, no smoking. Um, he is uh, living in the big city in Northwest um, in, in Urumqi. Mm -hmm. So uh, living alone. Uh, he he is. Yep. In a dirt house, a dirt floor hut, or what? Um, no, it's it's a concrete floor. It's actually uh, Xinjiang is in. Uh, so it's the Xinjiang province, Urumqi. It's an interesting um, community. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if any of our listeners have been there, but it, it, there's a large Muslim population there. Um, and what does he like to eat? Um, we don't get any, he doesn't have any specific dietary, um, you know. And he himself is not is not Muslim. And he, uh, has he traveled? <laughs> Did he raise, has he traveled lately? No, nope, doesn't travel, born, grew up in this uh, in this town. Any any bodies of water nearby? Um, not that he has had any contact with or that we hear about. All right, that's, that's my questions. <laughs> No, no hey, do you experience. have any questions? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you feel like you feel like you already have yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. information. I need the pro. All right. <laughs> you have everything with the CT scan. <laughs> All right. I was thinking of pasting in the CT scan, then I decided not to because no, I've actually seen the scan myself. But. All right, it's TWIP 216. Show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. You can send your guesses to TWIP at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, we would love to have your financial support. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from Tel Aviv University in Israel, A.L. Leshem. Thank you so much. Great case. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And it was a pleasure. Back. <laughs> but only look at that we get the cultural <laughs> reference very, I like it I like it <laughs> we'll be back Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org thelivingriver.org thank you Dixon yep. this is I love this show because the chatter after the case was amazing well then let's get it to a thousand and we can have a live event <laughs> 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 and which was a lot of fun, by the way. It was a blast. Yeah, it was a blast. Daniel yes, Griffin said, Columbia University Irving Medical Center, Parasites Without Borders .com. Thank you, Daniel. No, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And hey, everyone, join us in Chicago for the ASD. Yeah, please, team. please. Christina Nowlis at University of Glasgow. Thank you, Christina. Well, thank you. Had a great fun sorry, again, sorry, as usual. Sorry, it's so late. I know it's <laughs> tough over there, but uh, oof. Funny. It's not not so bad. I'm feeling quite awake now. Yeah. Um, it's much later for, for you, everyone, yeah, isn't it? You know, I don't know. <laughs> 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 what time is it at yours, Al? Oh. Oh, it's oh. two thirty a.m. Right, I'm almost <laughs> done here. All right, I'm almost done. I'm Vincent Dragon Yellow. You can find me at virology. Dot ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP. 
and Ronald Jenkins for the music. Uh, you did it last time, Daniel. Maybe go back to Dixon. Okay. Do the do the whole thing. I will. You have been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. Thank <laughs> you.